well, I don't really know um, how to follow up with a bunch of cute children. So I'm sorry, you got to look at me for the next, you know, 25 or so minutes. But uh, I digress. We keep going. Uh, man, it's super fun, though, to have the opportunity to see just all the families in our church that are growing and just the responsibility that it comes. But the beautiful thing about the church is we don't have to do it alone. That the part of this community, whether you have family here or whether you're far from your family, that hopefully uh, we strive to be that church where you can find that community, find that family in life's toughest seasons or, or the seasons of stress or the seasons of, of, of hope and of joy. Um, now, I, I want to start here this morning, but I don't know if you've ever had to make a compromise at some point in life. I think most of us probably say we would. And there's also times in which uh, maybe one of you decides to compromise and a friend, a coworker, a spouse decides, yeah, I'm, I'm not in this to compromise either. You know, one of, the, one of the biggest things that I learned in my life is, um, in my marriage with my wife, Diane, is that there is one thing that we learned early on that we will not compromise over, and that's leftovers, and so we had just gotten married. We were a couple weeks into our marriage. Uh, Diana was still finishing up school. I, I had already started working at a small church as the student pastor. And the night before, we went out to Olive Garden, my, my wife's favorite, favorite, favorite restaurant. And um, we get back home and we kind of put the, her leftovers in the fridge. Notice I said her leftovers in the fridge. And the next day, she had a full day. She was gone all day. She had to leave at like 7 a.m., wasn't going to get back to like 9 p.m. So she she was going to miss breakfast, lunch, and dinner at home. And so she went off to school, did the thing, and then I kind of did my normal day routine. I went to work, went to the gym, hung out with some friends, came home, and I was hungry. And so I went into the fridge, and I was like, huh, this chicken Alfredo sounds delicious. And uh, I was like, you know, and I thought to myself, I said, self, well, uh, your wife, if she really wanted this, would have taken it with her. I mean, she knew she was going to be missing both lunch and dinner. Prime opportunity. She could have just found a microwave at school. And so I, and it was delicious. Let me tell you, some of the best chicken Alfredo I've ever had. Well, then my wife gets home, makes a beeline for the refrigerator. And you know that, that, that like scene in TVs and movies where someone's like fuming and then it pans to the other person and they just have this look of despair, like, and they start sweating bullets and she looks me dead in the face. She goes, did you eat my chicken Alfredo? And I said, no, I did not. I think, you know, and I, I was like, I was like I, my first instinct was just to like to deny it and whatnot. And I said, well, honey, you got to understand, like, I just thought since, you know, we're married now, what's yours is mine, what's mine is yours type of, isn't that how it works? You were going to be gone for two whole meals if you really wanted it. And she said, I intentionally only ate half of it so that I could eat the other half when I got home later tonight. And I said, that's news to me. To this day, we have a rule in our house that leftovers cannot be touched unless the other person has either asked or made it. So like, we'll go out to it to eat and then we'll come home and like two days later, I'm like pulling it open, eyeing it. Not even, I'm not even gonna go there, right? I don't wanna get into one of these debacles again to which my wife will open up. She goes, yeah, that's fair game. You can have it. It's probably old and bad by now type of situation. You know, there are certain things in life that, that, that we make compromises over. I will compromise over this because it's small. I'll compromise over where we go to dinner. But I'm not going to compromise over if you can eat any of mine or not without asking. We might compromise over things like, well, where do we go on vacation? What movies should we go watch? Is there a television show that we want to share uh, as the night wind, winds down? There's even parts in church that I think it's okay for us to say we compromise. We can compromise over, well, perhaps what songs should we sing on a Sunday morning? What nights of the week should we offer certain programs? However, I would also say there are things that is in your best interest, in my best interest, in our best interest to not compromise. Like as a church and as Christians, we cannot compromise over the truth of Jesus Christ. We can never water it down. We can never compromise how someone is saved and finds salvation. We can't compromise in, in the value and the authority of Scripture. We cannot compromise that when Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. We cannot compromise, well, do I have to like that neighbor first or not? See, here's the thing. Here's what I want to start this morning. When it comes to this idea of compromise, if you're taking notes, this is your kind of first spot to fill in. But here's kind of the tension I want us to wrestle with this morning. It's this, is that compromise can be dangerous. 
You see, not all compromise is bad, not all compromise is deadly, but compromise can be dangerous. On one hand, there's small things that go ahead, compromise all you want over those small, minute details about life. But on the other hand, there are things that as Christians, as the church, as people, whether that's morals or values, what is ultimate truth, what is the direction of our life, those are things that we cannot and should never compromise over. So how do we know the difference? How do we know if something we are facing in life is something that that God might say, go ahead and compromise there or not? That's where we're headed today. So if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn with me to Acts chapter 24 this morning. Acts chapter 24. We are 24 weeks into this 28-week teaching series through the book of Acts. So we are almost done. We'll get through the book of Acts. Then it's going to be Christmas. And then, uh, then we'll have a new year upon us. Where we kind of left off last week is we found this guy by the name of Paul. And Paul found himself in the, back in the city of Jerusalem. And he was under this kind of court arrest facing trial for something he did not do. There's kind of these bad and false accusations coming his way. They claimed he was a rebel, an insurrectionist. They claimed that all he wanted to do was stir up all this trouble. And Paul's like kind of saying, yeah, that's not really who I am or what I'm about. And so today, the, 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 the court takes another step. They take it from maybe like the civil court and they are pushing it up the ladder. And we're gonna see that he goes before the governor of Rome. So before it was just these Jewish leaders who had a problem with Paul, but now he goes before the governor and they said, well, if you will listen to us, Paul, perhaps, perhaps Felix will take our side. So this is where we can pick up Acts chapter 24, starting in verse 1. It says, so five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullius. That just sounds like a lawyer, doesn't it? <laughs> What's your name? Tertullius. You must be a lawyer. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullius uh, presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you. And your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. He's, he's really understanding. He's buttering up Felix here. He says, everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to weary you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us ever so briefly. We have found this man, talking about Paul, to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. This goes on for about four or five more verses. Here's this guy, Paul. Here's who we believe him to be. Here is what we want you to do as a result. The high priest hires a lawyer. Like, this is a pretty big deal. And he's starting to butter up Governor Felix because he knows that the Roman government, the Roman Empire, did not like conflict. They did not like strife. They did not like people taking away from their power or from their influence. And so what's when he's starting to paint this picture? This Paul, he's a bad, bad man. He's a terrible guy. You know why? It's because he is stirring up people, trying to get them to turn away from the law and the rule and the authority that you have established, Felix. He's trying to get into his mind. So Felix is probably, man, these are some serious charges. Because any time throughout ancient Roman history, whenever there was an uprising, that person was used to make an example out of So this is the case being presented against Paul. Picking up in verse 10, we're going to see Paul's defense of himself. So this is what Paul says. He says, when the governor motioned for him to speak, Paul replied, I know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation. He's just spitting facts. He's not trying to butter them up too much. So I gladly make my defense. You can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago I went up to Jerusalem to worship. My accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our ancestors as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that is associated with the law and that it is written in the prophets. And I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. Paul's kind of saying here, so this is his defense. He's saying, yeah, I went to Jerusalem a few weeks ago. 
But he said, go ahead, find any witnesses, have them get any witnesses, and, and, and I, will, I will gladly stand before you if they can provide proof. But he says, I haven't stirred anything up. In fact, I came back to Jerusalem with a gift from other people of my cult to show hope, to show grace tangibly. I brought a financial gift to take care of the burden of other people. He said, I've never tried to stir anything up. I've never been violent. I have never gone out of my way to tell people to not listen to the Roman government. But he said, if what I am on trial before today is that I follow Jesus of Nazareth as the true Messiah of this world, then he said, by all means, try me at whatever you like. But he says, it's interesting because we have the same God. I said, they, they, you know, they, these people who, who have these charges against me, they, they worship that Old Testament God. I worship that God. They read the Torah, I read the Torah. They follow all of these rules, I follow a lot of these rules. The only difference that we have is they think Jesus was just a good prophet or a good rabbi. I believe him to be savior of the world. So Felix, it's up to you. What do you want to know? What do you want to decide? It's interesting because I think Paul paints an example here that our worship and our way of life as Christians and as disciples and as the church at large, should always foster hope, never hostility. But Paul also says, but I'm not going to compromise on the truth about Jesus just because a little pressure is coming my way. This is what Felix does, bringing back up in verse 24. It says, several days later, Felix came with his white Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. So so far, so good. It's going pretty peaceably. Verse 25, though, says, As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, That's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe so that he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus, but because Felix wanted to grant favor to the, a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. So Felix starts by deferring the case. Him and his wife say, hey, let's go talk to Paul, just kind of see what's going on here. And at first, things are seemingly going pretty peaceably, and then Paul says, hey, well, you want to know more about my faith? You want to know about this Jesus? And so he talks to him about three things. Well, this is what righteousness is. We are called to a life of self-control, and as a result, there's going to be judgment. And in that moment, that's when Felix really flips a switch. You see, he's lived a life of compromise up until this point. And for two years, he keeps Paul in house arrest, even though it was against Roman law to do something like that for at least two years. He's already compromising against his own way of life that he has aligned himself with. So the question I have is, why did Felix compromise? Well, maybe he wanted to be rich. Maybe he wanted to be powerful. Maybe he wanted to be well-liked. Now, all of those things aren't bad things in and of themselves. However, when we go about them the wrong way, we oftentimes are convinced to take shortcuts, to make compromises in order to get there. It's not wrong to be rich. But Felix says, I'm going to get rich by offering people the chance to bribe me. You see, what compromise has a tendency to do is to convince you it's okay to take some shortcuts. It's okay to cut some corners in order to get to where you want to go just a little bit quicker. But the thing is, if you cut enough corners, if you take enough shortcuts, you end up leaving yourself in a position to cut out the meat. There's no more corners to cut, so therefore you have to start cutting through the things that you once held dear in order to make that compromise a reality. The other side of the question, though, is why didn't Paul compromise? Like, think about this for a moment. Let's, Let's say for a moment, you did something, you were living your life, and somebody threw an accusation against you, and now result, you find yourself in a courtroom. You find yourself facing death row, essentially. Wouldn't you be tempted to make a slight compromise in order to get out of that situation? Wouldn't wouldn't you be tempted to say, okay, maybe I'll just soften it here. 
I, I, I know these people, they will drop the charges if I just, you know, renounce that truth. Maybe I can only, I can do it in a way that I only renounce part of it and then I will find myself free of this and I can get on with my life. I can get on with my mission. I can get on with my goal. If I could just maybe do a slight little compromise. Now we don't know, I'll be honest, we don't know if Paul wanted to compromise. But Paul was a human, just like you and I. It had to have crossed his mind. I could just let up over here. Well, I could go back and soften my approach and tell them this. Well, if I just go easy on that truth and maybe not be so, so stark or maybe perhaps so, so, so direct about it, maybe then I could just get out of this mess and go on. But he doesn't. He doesn't soften the truth. He doesn't offer a bribe. He doesn't take the easy way out. See, to me, this chapter paints this very stark dichotomy of life. You have a man in power and a man in position who is willing to compromise almost every value and every ounce of his being to get ahead and stay ahead. And then you have a man of faith on this side who is facing something that really isn't his to bear, something that is not fair. And in order to get out of a situation that he does not to deserve to be in. All it would take is one simple, small compromise. And that leads me to the question I want to ask us all this morning. When you face compromise on the big scale, again, I'm not talking about eating someone's leftovers, even though it's really good chicken alfredo, okay? When you face the temptation to compromise in life, what is it over but more importantly, what gets you there in the first place? Why do we compromise in life to begin with? A couple of thoughts, a couple of reasons why I think we compromise. Number one, sometimes we compromise over selfish reasons. We make compromise and we say, okay, well, if I do that over there, it'll lift me up. If I do this over here, this will be something that I can kind of, you know, feel good about myself. Sometimes we make compromise for selfish reasons because it's going to push us further, faster. We get more money. We get uh, out of a situation that we found ourselves in, so we make a compromise. We, we, do, we do compromise for a lot of reasons, but sometimes, a lot of times, it's selfish motives. Well, I want this. My heart is tugging at me. It's the desire of my life. Therefore, I'm going to compromise that truth. I'm going to compromise that moral. I'm going to compromise that value because it's going to do something for me. Sometimes we compromise over societal motives. Well, everyone else is doing it, so I guess I can too. If, if the whole stream of society is going that way, I could just hop in for a little bit and cruise and then hop out. Nobody's really going to know the difference. I'm going to go ahead and make that compromise so that way it protects me. I don't want to be labeled. I don't want people to call me funny names. I don't want people to hate me because of that stance or that belief I have. So therefore, when it comes down to it, I'll make a compromise because society will take it a little bit easier on me. And sometimes we compromise for what I call self-interest. It's not the same as selfish. It's similar, but a self-interest compromises things like, well, I want to keep peace with people. So I'm not going to stand firm or I'm going to water that down. It's not maybe selfish. You're not going to get anything out of it other than maybe feeling comfortable. You make a compromise because it's easier than doing the right thing. It might not necessarily be wrong or bad, but you compromise on doing what you know to do. You see, I think, I think sometimes there's like the, the, Christian, the great Christian compromise. Should we be people of truth or should we be people of love? And people compromise between these two all the time. Well, I'm going to speak the truth, and I don't care who it's going to hurt. I don't care how I go about it, because the truth is the truth, and the truth needs to be truth to everyone so they know the truth. And we go about sharing the truth in harsh ways, unkind ways that people don't even hear. So we compromise telling the truth in a non-loving manner. We say, it's just the truth. The other side, though, I think people compromise in the other way. They say, well, we're supposed to be people of love. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. So everything we do ought to be based on. And so then we end up compromised not sharing truth or standing on truth because we want to be seen and known as people of love. And the answer is not which one. The answer is we speak the truth in love. You see, the truth should never give us reason 
to act in non-loving manners towards others. But love can also be an excuse to gloss over what is true. If I were to sum it up, I would sum it up this way. Why do we compromise? What's compromise it's about? Is compromise is our way of getting our way instead of following God's way. Think about a moment in which you have made a compromise before. Chances are there was something you wanted. Probably contrary to God's way. And so you compromised because you wanted your way. So when it comes to following God, obedience is oftentimes, not often, always talked about as an all or nothing approach. Now that's not to say if you don't live a perfect life, God's going to kick you out of the club. That's not what it is. But when we are called to live holy lives, when Paul is talking to Felix about righteousness and self-control, he's talking about as this is how you are called to live. And what compromise leads us to do is to objectify parts of God's ways, parts of God's commands or laws. We begin to take things that God says and we begin to think, well, I don't know, did God really mean that? I mean, God seems a little dated there. Is that, is that actually the way is best? And so we objectify certain things that God has commanded of us. Well, that's things like sex or sexuality, relationships, money, gossip, power, influence. We objectify God's command in a way in which we compare our way, our desires against his. You name it. And the thing about compromise is, is like, doesn't it feel like you get away with it in the moment? Like, like, don't you feel like when you make a compromise, you make it, and then you kind of look around, and you're like, man, this doesn't seem all that bad. This doesn't seem all that, that tough or that hard. I don't know if God knows what he's talking about. See, compromise starts to get dangerous because of its delayed effects oftentimes. The wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, he wrote uh, the book of Proverbs. And in Proverbs chapter 14, he offers this nugget of wisdom. Ironically, you could turn to chapter 16 and see the exact same verse given. He says, there is a way that appears to be right. But in the end, it leads to death. There's a way that appears to be right on the surface. A compromise seems okay in the moment. But because of its delayed effects, it leads to death. Compromise feels good in the moment. Compromise seems right at the time. Compromise is easily covered over if there's a bunch of other people in our life that we can compare ourselves against. You know, a lot of you know that I, I grew up in San Diego, and um, one of our, our running jokes when people were trying to determine if people were tourists or not is how they would get out of the water after being caught in a riptide. So this is what usually happens, right? So, so those of us who grew up on the beach, we kind of know how the oceans works. Uh, whether we're surfing, bodyboarding, just swimming, we go out, we, do, we come in, and then we, you know, flip our hair, do all that, and, you know, and just walk back to where we're going to be. Okay, that's how we do it, if you want to know the secret. The people who aren't from around the area, people who say ope all the time, which is me now, okay, just so you know, I'm, I'm fully Midwestern. They go into the water, and they're enjoying the waves, and they're swimming, and they're splashing, and then they're, they, they get salt water. They don't really know what salt water tastes like. And then they get out of the water, and I kid you, this is what happens. They get out of the water, and, and then they, they go, and they have this scared look upon them. They're like, they're, like, they're lost, they're like, and, they're like, and they look at the water, and they look, and, and, there's, and then they're like, oh my goodness, I'm this far down the beach. How did I get over here? I was just in the water. I was just swimming. I was just enjoying the waves. And they always have this scared look on their face. They're just like, whoa, magic, crazy. See, that's what compromise is like to me. As you're just not really noticing, you are slowly drifting. You get in at one point, thinking you're going to get out at that point, only to arrive, to get out later, to realize you are further down the beach than you ever intended. 
what compromise is like for, for almost every single one of us. We are all tempted to compromise. And what we tend to compromise over is not our heart. We don't tend to compromise over our wishes, our desires. We tend to make compromises on God's commands. We all typically compromise over God's commands. Because we think he made a mistake. We think he doesn't know what he's talking about. We don't believe he knows or has set up things to be what is best. You see, when I, when I ever you know, spent some time reflecting on my own life this week, of the many, many, many compromises I have made, it's usually because I made a compromise over God's command. And remember the compromises that I regret. The compromises where I think to myself, I wish I could go back and do that all over again. It's because I made a compromise over God's way. Typically, not always, but most of the time. A failure to surrender that moral, that thing, that relationship, that money, that person, that responsibility. There you might say, I chose the approval of man. Uh, I chose acceptance from others. I chose filling my desires over God's desires for my life, over God's. Compromise is tricky. We face it all the time. And before we know it, we find ourselves further down the beach. That's why if you go back to Acts chapter 5, verse 29, the, the, the first disciples, as they were in this notion of how do we take this thing called the church and the truth and to spread it everywhere, and they were starting to receive persecution, trying to get them to stop. And they made this resolution between all of them. They said, Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. We will not compromise over our truth. We will not compromise over our mission. We will not compromise over what God has called us to do. Because here's the thing. We compromise is we oftentimes view God's commands as constraints. Well, God, you're going to take away all my fun. Why does everybody else get to do that and you want me to live this way? Do you not know what fun is? Why do I got to live in this manner to be faithful and obedient to you, God? This doesn't sound like something I really want to sign up for. But the thing is, with every negative command of God's, it's because God is waiting to give you two positive ones in return. If you take this constraint and you follow it, God always delivers two positive ones in return, a blessing and a promise of his provision. As if you follow me in this, I know you don't want to. If you follow me in this, I know that might be difficult for you. If you follow me in this, God is faithful to say, but I have a blessing waiting for you, and don't worry, I will take care of you along the way. You see, Satan wants to take down men and women of faith. And the first wave of attack is always compromise. Well, if I can get them to just take a step this way, if I can get them to make one little decision, one little choice over here, then maybe they will start to drift this way. Think about how the whole thing started. You go back to Genesis chapter 3. What did Satan say to Eve? Just, just a taste. Just a little taste. Don't you want to know the difference between good and evil like God? Yeah, I know he's, he's blessed you. I know he's provided for you. But don't you think this way is just a, a little bit better? Just a, just a taste. Just, just, go, just go to the tree and look at it. You don't even have to pick it. Just look at it. Just think about what could happen, what could be yours. Go ahead, just pluck it off. Did he really say you can't eat of anything? Just, just a taste. So the whole concept of sin started not with this massive fall, but with a conviction or a convincing to compromise. And it's a temptation, it's a struggle we all face today. See, to me, compromise is like choosing to drink poison despite the warning. 
Let's say you got a, got a bottle of poison laying around your house. I mean, who would really do that type of thing? This is real poison, by the way. You can tell by how official it is. It's okay. What's it really going to harm? You probably shouldn't even have it. You probably shouldn't even put it in your home. Don't even be near it. It's dangerous. It will kill you. But, I mean, the cap's still on. I've never actually sipped any of it. It's okay. Well, you know, though, I read that story of that one person who took a big swig, and they were fine. I mean, I'm reading this warning label back here, and, you know, and I'm kind of looking at the label, and I'm like, man, do they, do they I mean, this, this was made a while ago. You know, these people, maybe it's a, little, it's a little dated. Do those scientists actually know anything? I mean, come on. They just kind of make stuff up. They're just trying to, you know, get us to not drink poison. What's the big deal? I mean, I mean, what's the real danger in it? Oh, I mean, it smells great. It doesn't seem like it's that harmful. Sally had a sip the other day, and she's doing just fine. Bill drank all of his, and he hasn't croaked over it yet. I mean, I know there's a lot of things warning me about it, but, I mean, it smells pretty good. Just, you know. Oh, yeah, see, I'm still here. I'm still here, guys. Nothing ever happened. I know God said, you know, to kind of keep, keep sex in between one man and one woman in the confines of marriage. But, you know, that seems it's a little, a little dated, a little, a little overly verbose for me. I know God talks about uh, doing everything with, 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 with righteousness, of living a self-controlled life. But it's cool. I can just go ahead and, and, and get angry and, 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 you know, because there's grace, right? I know it says God looks at the heart. But man, I could cut a few corners over here and then... Yeah, and then I'll, you know, I'll make some more money. And then, you know, I'll just kind of, you know, rip some people off. But then, you know, I can give more money to the church. It's okay, it's cool. You know, God wants me to love my neighbor. But he doesn't love live next to Steve like I do. It's cool, you know. I know, I know, I know. God has 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 plans for 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 my life. But man, I mean, I really like my plans. They're just as good. I think. I know God has given me a source of truth and everything to revolve my life around because I know that He is good and that He loves me and that He cares for me. But Well, it's, just, it's just one time. What's it actually going to hurt? This is actually burning right now because it's not, it's not poison, but it's Mountain Dew. <laughs> Compromise is like choosing to drink poison despite the warnings. Bill Watterson, he's a great, uh, he's not a theologian, but I like to think of him. He's the guy who wrote Cabin and Hobbes. He said this, he said, you know what's weird? Day by day, nothing seems to change, but pretty soon everything's different. It's the danger of compromise. What's one compromise? What's it actually going to do? Day by day, nothing seems to change, but eventually everything is different. So how do we fight off compromise? Let me close with this thought. You live to please the one instead of everyone. You live to please the one true God who has said, these are my commands. This is my truth. This is my way of life. This is what I require of you. Worry about my approval. Worry about my plan. Don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Don't worry about what everyone else is going around and saying. Don't worry about what everyone else has okayed. Live to please me. instead of everyone else. My plan is one of truth and of love. Determine yourself to walk close with me. Because the closer we walk with God, the safer life feels. 
And those commands that we thought were constraints actually become great rewards because God's blessing and God's provisions begin to come our way. When we are close with God, we hear his voice. When we are close with God, we trust in his promises. When we are close with God, we plan on his provisions. Is he saying no to compromise? It's difficult. It's hard. I understand it. But it's like a magnet. That it's going to want to pull you in. And in order to push it away, you don't need something that will, well, I know what is right. I affirm what is right. No, 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 no. You need a force that is just as powerful, if not more powerful, to push it away. We fight off compromise not by white knuckling our way through life. We don't fight off compromise by by thinking, okay, well, I just got to get back. We fight off compromise by saying, I will walk close with God. I will know his truth. I will hear his voice. I will trust his promises and his provision. And so even when life says, it's okay, just take a little sip. It's okay. Just get a little taste. Everyone else is doing it. What's one time? Nobody's actually going to know. I've determined I will walk close with God. His voice, I will trust his promise. He's never led me astray, and he won't start now. We live to please the one instead of everyone. We defeat compromise by choosing to walk close with God. Would you pray with me as we continue to worship our Lord this morning? Father, we humbly bow before you this morning. God of love, the God of life, the God of truth, the one true God, the one true God who has given us the one true word, the one God who has given us new life. You are King Jesus. You are Lord of Lords, King of Kings. You are sovereign. You are everywhere and your spirit lives in us if you have given us new life. Lord, we can't even take another perhaps moment or step in worshiping you without thanking you for your grace, for the many compromises we have perhaps made in this life. We are, we are, we are so grateful to know that you continue to love us despite those, but, but we also want to embrace the life you've given us, a life free of compromise because we have chosen to walk close with you. We worship you and you alone today. May you be the one that we live to please.